Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales of the Mystified podcast. We are joined by Zach Figpan, uh, currently Head of Operations at Augment CXM. Zach, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tom. So, Zach, we're going to be attacking sales operations from a slightly different angle this time. So, Zach has a varied experience, venture partner, founder of his own business, um, but actually kind of has a more more broader perspective on RevOps and ops in general. So we're going to be taking sales ops on from that perspective. And also, uh, Augment is at a relatively early stage. So we're going to see how we lay solid foundations for the revenue operations machine in the early days. So is that an accurate description of what we're going to be chatting about, Zach? Absolutely. Sounds good. Um, also, so let's kick off. First question, how did you come into the world of operations or revenue operations? Yeah, so I've been a startup, startup, startup guy my whole career. That's always uh, been, I've just been building skills there and building um, experiences in a variety of different capacities. So I kicked off my career um, after my undergrad, uh, building out a marketing department for, funny enough, a go-kart company. Uh, The reason that I ended up at that job was because it gave me the opportunity to go into, you know, build a department and do something that a lot of 22 year olds don't get to do um, as opposed to a lot of more, the more traditional startup roles for, for people that are straight out of undergrad that aren't technical. So for me, you know, I got to build that department over four years as I was um, we were going from one location to five locations, 2 million in revenue to 16 million in revenue. And it was a really good experience for me to learn how to manage resources and be scrappy and also you know, try to expand that uh, knowledge of, of how to build a department and, and have it be numbers driven and um, be able to track data in a very analog business where people are walking in the door and how do you figure out how, how they come in the door. So that was a really good experience for me. Um, then I ended up, you know, I was working for a couple different startups on the side as well, uh, just getting my feet wet in the more traditional VC backed type of startups, you know, 3D printing was was a big one for me. Um, ended up at Berkeley for my MBA program. Um, I was very focused on, on venture capital while I was there because for me, it was about building pattern recognition. Um, it's, as you can see, I'm, I'm fairly data-driven. So it's what are good companies doing? Um, how, how do you kind of identify what a successful company looks like? Um, and then, you know, was, was founder of my, founder of a company from there. Uh, that kind of fell apart uh, as we were about to go through Y Combinator. Um, and then I joined um, Cobalt and the, the revenue operations capacity. And then uh, a couple, a month and a half ago, I just joined at Augment. Um, so I'm happy to go into my specific details uh, at Cobalt and why revenue operations, I think, is very important if you think that would be helpful. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the next best, best step. So if we understand you've been in earlier stage company than venture, and then what made you, or what drew you towards the RevOps role at Cobalt? So I think um, revenue operations in general, I think is, is a really good way to go about, especially for startups, a really good way to go about building repeatability and scalability on the revenue side of the business. Um, I, the reason I like revenue operations and I, I will be founding a revenue operations team at Augment um, as opposed to a sales ops team is because, um, a, you know, and I was sitting inside the finance department. I think you can house it within the finance department or the operations department as long as it's not siloed within a specific marketing sales or CS department. Um, the reason that I like that is because a, it's not siloed, um, so you're, you're not playing favorites. You're, you're really um, trying to, to spend resources and optimize for what's best for the company as, as opposed to a particular department. Um, B is because I had access to all the data being in the finance department. So, I mean, I was building comp plans and I was pulling numbers out of our financial systems and, and it, it was really important for me to have access to all that data and be closely tied to our finances because as we all know, revenue and sales in general is a pretty big cost center for businesses. I mean, they're generating revenue, but they're expensive organizations to build. And so understanding what the expenses were was very important. And then three, uh, just creating alignment across the marketing sales and CS teams was critical for me. And that, that's why I think that's the number one reason why I think RevOps is, is, is crucial is because, 
um, you're able to, you know, have aligned goals, uh, have a North star goal and understand that, um, each of the departments is pointing in the same direction. And that's not only for the internal purposes, the operations purposes, but that's also for customer facing things. So the customer life cycle is ha- they're, they're having a complete, um, and, and, an experience that that is consistent for as they're being handed off from uh, one department to the next. Got it. Um, and now at Augment, what's the current team size? I know you guys are relatively early stage. And what, if any, sales tech do you have in place? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're around 20. Um, and so we have a couple sales guys, an SDR, a couple CSMs, um, one marketing person, but we're, we're selling enterprise software. So marketing is a lot more branding right now and a lot more um, biz dev uh, than it is traditional inbound marketing. So uh, right now our tech stack is, we have a very clean Salesforce instance. Um, our CRO, who's very experienced, um, he's gone, he's taken four IPOs, you know, he's gone to four, through four IPOs and he built the Salesforce instance a, a little bit before I joined, kept it very clean. Um, we just moved our CS team out of Clubhouse, which is a little more engineering centric, but a very, very technical product. So it allowed us to be uh, very integrated with the product team. Um, but we moved that, we moved out of Clubhouse into Salesforce. Um, and that, the reason we did that is because it just gives, it's, it's a little better built um, for what we need it for, which is account management. Um, when you're dealing with enterprise customers, I think that's, that's critical. And then I'm moving, I'm in the process of uh, moving kind of our CS, creating our CS playbook and then putting that into Notion. Um, and not just the playbook on, in terms of like plays, like, hey, what happens if a customer gets locked out of their account? But also like the customer life cycle, the 365 day life cycle, um, as well as like the QBR uh, checklist and, and everything like that. So um, I think it's good to have that kind of outside of Google Drive and also in a place where it's not in Salesforce. Like Salesforce is for the day-to-day account management. This is for more onboarding someone, um, but, you know, because right now I'm running our CS team. And so um, I, I'm, I'm building it out in a way that, that will be repeatable moving. Got it. And we may have to go back to Co- Cobalt for this next question. Sure. Um, and, but, but also probably relevant to the work you're doing at the moment. Um, can, you, can you share an example where you've had, you've had something that you as the ops person wanted to implement, but then the reps, whether it's CS or sales, didn't necessarily see the value, but you still had to try and influence them to take that on? Yeah. Um, the way I think about it is, when you're in an ops role, it's it's a little bit of a give and take. Um, you need to be thoughtful about that because oftentimes you're going to be asking people to add more process to their day to day. So you got to make sure that you're providing value and and making their lives easier in some ways. So I would always try to whatever projects I was doing, I would try to flip flop. You know, one project would be you know, uh, hey, us as finance, we're taking on deal desk and we're taking over invoicing um, from you guys, the reps. And now I'm going to put in, you know, a system where I need you to close out any deal that hasn't been touched in 30 or 60 days or whatever it is, right? So, you know, I always would try to go back and forth like that. And and, And also it's about people management too, right? So you need to build a good rapport. You need to explain why it's necessary, what you're building. Um, but yeah, there's plenty of times when, I mean, I was blocked by management before um, implementing a QBR structure because we were onboarding a you know new CS person and or new new CS leader, and um, you know it, it just we needed to to kind of ha- take a step back because and reevaluate the full process and not just one piece of how the CS function looked. Um, so oftentimes I've had more issues. Um, from the top level of, of departments rather than the individual reps. Uh, generally, with individual reps, they, they are responsive as long as they understand why you need what you need and that you make it very clear that uh, process is a part of their job and it's a part of how they're um, evaluated, not just the number that they're hitting. So 
you know, it's always a question, you know, with sales leaders or, or whatever, any, any revenue leader um, and operations is, you know, what would you rather have a rep that is at 80% of their number, but follows process or a rep that's at 150% of their number, but doesn't follow process. So, you know, that's always, that's always a hard question. There's no right answer there, but for me, I'm a process guy. So that's, that's always the way I lean. Got it. And right now in augment, is there anything you're doing to drive productivity in these early stages? Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of it is building out repeatable processes. And so right now, um, you know, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of unique things with every customer that we have. Um, and there's a lot of unique things with particularly our CSMs and, um, we need to kind of operationalize that and make sure in order to move forward in like a repeatable way. And I keep using the same terminology, but a bit, a business is a business, right? If you're talking about B2B SaaS or B2B in general, like the, a lot of this operations stuff, a lot of this is, is, is going to be the same no matter what the actual product is. So right now um, a lot of it is focused on documentation and also I've stepped in, you know, leading CS right now and being an advocate uh, for, for CS between, so between sales and product. And the way I look at it is, you know, sales is being squeezed on one side by the board and the leadership for hitting a number and on the other side for customer success. Customer success is being squeezed on one side by sales by saying, but, you know, for, for selling things that, you know, maybe we do have, maybe we don't. And on the other side by product for, by saying like, oh, you know, we can't get this you know, and, or, or we have other priorities. So it's all about negotiations from the product, uh, from the departmental leaders. And so right now, um, implementing processes and implementing realistic timelines for implementation and things like that um, is really helpful for how we, uh, how we're going to end up like getting to where we need to be and getting um, to that. Every customer is, has the same process and every customer is treated the same. Got it. So what well, you're basically saying that it's important at this stage to make sure you have the almost a service level agreements between departments totally. and all the processes documented so that when you do start adding two sales people a week, you can handle yep. stress. And also I think uh, this is a, this is about optimizing resources too, because if your actions aren't repeatable and if people are doing different things within departments and what happens when you hire a new person, um, are, are, you know, and, and also, okay, so then and are, are you able to kind of get economy of resources like SDRs? Um, or, you know, do you need to have, do you need to hire, when you hire one more like AE, do you also need to hire a new SDR and a new CSM? But, you know, if you have good processes, you can probably get away with holding off those new hires for longer and longer. Um, but it, it just depends on how you, how you set things up and how you do things early. Got it. And so right now your role as, because you're running the whole of the operation, right? Mm -hmm. So your role is, you're actually perfectly placed in order to fit above all these departments and ensure that everything's working correctly. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, I'm wearing a lot of hats. So part of my role right now is I'm running finance, I'm running HR, I'm running admin. Um, I'm back office. It's, it's early stage, right? So um, I'm, I'm handling a number of different things, but a big part of what I'm focusing on is making sure um, that we, uh, that because I, I love looking at metrics and if, especially David Skoke's SAS metrics 2.0. Um, I, I, so I build, I build an operations function and a, and a revenue operations function from data on up. Um, and right now, you know, the data is, is, a little too lumpy um, and and uh, doesn't look it, it's it's not as helpful as I would like it to be. So the first thing I did when I joined is build a um, KPI dashboard uh, for for every department and especially focused on the revenue side of things. And so us being able to get to a you know and some of that is like hey you know SDR and AEs don't spend one week doing outbound and then the next week doing nurturing like try to keep your weeks fairly even so that the pipeline is fairly smooth um, and an upward trajectory. Uh, Cause that's going to help us moving forward. Cause it, if you don't do that now, then it's then, you know, when you have, when you're tripling the team size 
you're going to have a super lumpy uh, revenue cycle. And that's just not, that's not scalable. Can't bring on temps and Q4 to close deals, you know? Got it. So uh, a lot of what I'm hearing is like focus on how this is going to look in a bit like 10 exercise. Yeah. Right. And we need to get that. Well, right now. Yes and no. I, you know, I think that the reality is you build the earlier you are, you know, right now I'm building things that'll hopefully last us six months in a year from now, I'll hopefully be building things that'll last us a year. Um, but you, if you don't have the right foundations, there are very simple foundations, right? That, um, you know, people like reps or, or prospects should be moving through the pipeline at a certain velocity and they should be hitting certain, certain check marks um, along the pipeline uh, before they get to the next stage, right? Those are, those are things that are going to last throughout the life cycle of the company. And also like, okay, SDR, maybe don't reach out to 600 people right now and then 50 the next week, maybe sp spread that out and, and have that be 200 each week over the next three weeks. Um, and, and so I think those are things that that'll last for forever, but the way that, you know, me throwing our, all of our accounts into Salesforce, like that'll probably work for now, but down the road, we'll probably need to get, you know, Gainsight or another tool of that nature to manage CS. Got it. Who's your next hire in the operations department? The next hire is, hmm, that's a good question. In the operations department? Uh, I mean, it would just be like, you know, a junior me. So someone that would take on a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would like to hire another CSM at some point, um, or a QA engineer, like maybe someone that is kind of more of a solutions architect slash QA engineer, um, mm -hmm. that is sitting very close in between product and CS. Got it. Um, but those so are like, unicorns. Those are hard hires to make. <laughs> They're not cheap. Mm. And so, okay, for next op types, it could be like a mini U to take some of the stuff so you can focus on solving bigger problems, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, it's I'm run, you know I'm running these these various departments right now, and so I just need another another set of hands, really. Got it. Um, forecasting sales. Are you? Does that sit under you at the moment? Sales. Yeah, sales forecasting. Oh, sales forecasting. Um, I work closely with our CRO, who essentially is running sales. Um, he's not running marketing or anything else right now. He's running sales. Um, and I'm, we're, we're building, we were just building out the forecast this past week. And that's, that's a collaborative effort between me and him. And again, I, it's, I, it's funny because I almost like want to buy different hats for me at work so I can say, okay, now I'm taking off my operations, revenue operations hat and putting on my CS hat so that I can talk about the projections we just made and how that affects like our CS team. Um, and so, I, you know, I was negotiating with him on our forecast in, in, a mul in multiple capacities, but trying to basically keep it smooth and think about, um, you know, who's where the handoff happens and, and, you know, how long sales stays in the loop and who's responsible for setting meetings at certain times, like things like that. Got it. And what, right now, what are your favorite revenue related metric? Uh, oh, that's a good one. Um, my favorite revenue related metric. Let me just look it up real quick so I can say it. Um, it's called pipeline velocity. And I don't know, have you, are you familiar with that? I think that has come up once before, but I'm not sure if I'd be able to give an accurate description. Okay. It's a great one. So essentially it's the number of open opportunities, new opportunities times, uh, the conversion rate times, um, the ASP, but really the gross margin ASP, um, divided by the average length of the sales cycle. And basically, if you break that apart, like what that number tells you is how much money, how much revenue is moving through your pipeline every day. And so if you multiply that number by 365, you should get a pretty, pretty clear idea of where you're at from a revenue perspective, how close you are or how on track you are to hitting your number. Um, and the interesting thing about that is if your number doesn't look as good, then okay, you can look at those four pieces and figure out like, 
you know, my last company, we had a sales cycle issue, hence why I was like having people closed out deals earlier, you know, um, but that's, it's, but if you look at that number, that's essentially what it's telling you. Got it. So just so I understand, so number of open opportunities, so all the opportunities you have. New, um, yeah, new business. New, oh yeah, new, open new biz opportunities. Yep. Um, Time to conversion rate makes sense. Times by the, I think, so you said ASP, I think I sent as ACV, maybe? Uh, yeah, I mean, it depends on how you book. It depends on how you book revenue. Um, I mean, you could also do ARPA, uh, like if you're counting first year upsells. But, I, you know, I, I like to, I think ASP is a good one um, there. And, and what is, is that average selling price? Yeah, average sales price. So Got ASP, it. and then I would do it. Um, I, I like doing it gross margin. Yeah. Um, everybody's different. The, you can kind of make this your own. Um, but th- those are the basic. Those are the basic. Uh, you know, ingredients for this for this formula. Got it. And then divided by average sales cycle. So basically, if your CRO or head of sales comes in as like, oh, we're going to hit our annual target, you can just run them through that equation, and then that that could give you a good idea of where you are. Yep. And then you're like, oh, we don't have enough open opportunity, you know, and then you're like, oh, we're not going to hit it. Maybe we don't have enough open opportunities. Let's have a sprint for new, new opportunities. Let's buy a bunch of Zoom info credits or whatever and get, and get going there. Awesome. Yeah, I think that has come up before, but we, we didn't go into that with detail. Um, fantastic. And then the final question is about who in the world of operations has kind of taught you or mentored you the most in, in your career? Mentored me the most. Um, well, I would say from a website perspective, uh, David Skoke. So the, like SAS yeah. metrics 2.0 is, is definitely, you know, what, what I build off of. Um, but personally, um, it's a good question. I guess, uh, Hmm. I don't know if I have a good answer to that. A lot of it is just picking stuff up as I go. Um, yeah, let me get back to you on that. <laughs> no, that's I don't right. have a good answer right off the top of my head. So, so, so this guy, Dave, how, how, how do you spell his surname? It's David. Skok, S-K-O-K. Cool. I will link that below because it sounds pretty relevant to the audience. So yeah, look at just. SAS metrics uh, 2.0, I think, is, is, the, is the best one to look up for there. Got it. And he just details metrics that will be useful for measuring performance of SaaS companies. Totally. Yeah, on the Got revenue it. side. You know what? I do have an answer um, for, for that last question. So uh, have you, you ever heard of the book recommended to all your listeners, Scaling the Revenue Engine by Tom Moore? Nope, but I will do. Yeah, so link to that too. Tom Moore is the man. He's really smart. He's writing a new book right now. Um, he's kind of been building out, uh, you know, kind of this whole. But scaling the revenue engine is is specifically about uh, the revenue, basically the revenue engine and the metrics that go into that and the operations that go into that. And he has a scorecard for like where you're at on one to five on a, on all these different. Um, you know, data sources and tools and things like that. Um, and he's great. And he was uh, nice enough to come and speak at a RevOps event that I, I put together um, not too long ago. So he's, he's, he's great. Got it. Awesome. Um, that, was, that was a nice session. A more, a definitely a more like general generic ops overview, which I think is good um, because it got me thinking about a lot of stuff that we never that I never heard of or discussed before. I particularly liked your point about um the negotiation and give and take. And if you are gonna try and get people do stuff like it's good to announce that when you are going to them and being like, yeah, we're taking away invoicing, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the stuff about making sure you have the foundations in place, uh the processes and the relationships between departments in place uh for when you scale. But yeah, for, as you said, maybe it's only relevant for the next six months because stuff changes so fast when you are at the early stages. Um, and yeah, I, I, the other point, which I thought was quite profound, is that the operation stuff is actually quite the same for like any kind of business, or like SaaS or service business, um, regardless of what you're saying, which I never really thought about before, but actually 
if, like a lot of the processes you could just lift and shift between different businesses if they are in the SaaS industry, right? And so that's something that I haven't really come across. Um, Zach, that was really good. Thank you so much for coming on. No problem. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for having me.